Hello, everyone. Welcome back to the Van Maren Show. Today, we're going to be talking to Frank Buckley about whether or not the United States is so polarized that secession could be on the table. That's coming right up. Hello, everybody, and welcome back to the Van Maren Show on LifeSiteNews.com. My name is Jonathan Van Maren, and today I'm going to be talking to F.H. Buckley, the author of a new book called American Secession, The Looming Threat of a National Breakup. He is a scholar at the George Mason School of Law and editor at the American Spectator. He writes regularly for the New York Post. He's written for the Wall Street Journal and many other mainstream publications. And he joins me to talk about his new book and talk about whether or not there is actually a chance that the United States of America, as a result of the polarization it is currently going through, might actually break up. That's this conversation. Thanks for joining us. All right. Well, just to start off, I guess the first question I want to ask you is, what is the basic thesis, the case that you're making in this book on American secession? The basic thesis is that it's much more likely than anyone thinks and possibly much less to be feared than many people think. Although it was a book written against secessionism, it was a book intended to persuade people that something short of that would be preferable and that which would be short of it would be something like a a renewed sense of federalism, which I called home rule. So when you say there's a looming threat of a national breakup, I think the looming part is probably where you get uh, the most amount of pushback. Um, where would you say this threat is looming? Where would you point to uh, when, in terms of, like, what, what says this is imminent? Well, looming is a happily ambiguous term. <laughs> if something could happen in three or four years' time, it's still fair to say it's, it's looming. Uh, I recall how McLean's Magazine, you're in Canada, right? Yes. yes. I recall how McLean's Magazine back in the 60s had a cover story on René Levesque, and the, 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 uh, the story was headed, the title of the story was, Should This Man Be Prosecuted for Sedition? Right? And then a few years later, the guy is in the cabinet, and a few years after that, he's the premier of the province holding a referendum on secession. Well, uh, nobody much saw it coming. I mean, it, it built up rather slowly. To then take a look at America today, at all of the craziness of, of our politics, and in particular the way in which I think the left has quite gone mad on the subject of Trump, Um, And they put all their chips on the idea that Trump can be defeated. What, however, if Trump is reelected in 2020? Uh, I'd have no idea whether or not that's going to happen or not. Um, Certainly, a few months back, it seemed to me more likely than not. Were it to happen, how would the left react to that? I, I, I think, you know, there's a tendency amongst them right now to say, look, we don't accept that he's not our president, um, and we're just going to wait for this craziness to be over, and then everything will snap back and we'll be back in charge. Right. And, you know, very likely, very possibly, it won't snap back. We've seen, uh, we'll have seen a permanent change in our politics, and the change will be one, moreover, in which the ball has been taken away from the left. I mean, the left at this point more or less thinks it has ownership over America. It owns the media. It thought it owned the courts. Of of that, it's far less sure right now. Um, It thought it could get its way that that, uh, it had a a Whig theory of history in which everything would unfold in their direction. Mm -hmm. And that's roughly the way these people think at the New York Times and the Washington Post and so on. And they're going to be, I think, quite disappointed. I think that it's at least as likely that Trump will be re- reelected and that the, um, the, the, the culture war, which they thought they had won, will be one which they will have lost. I don't think they can accept that. I mean, you see, conservatives are pretty good about sucking things up. We sucked things up in 2008 when Obama was elected. Uh, these guys on the left have thinner skins 
and they don't suck things up. And so, and so, you know, looking at the craziness of today, you then ask yourself, how much crazier can this be? Right. And that's where you might see a looming threat of a national breakup. So one of the interesting things uh, about your thesis is, is I'm, I'm wondering to what extent this, um, that a lot of people talk about in a, se- a secession as sort of a knee-jerk response to a, a, a result they don't like. So I remember within the first week after Obama's re-election, there was talk about Texas seceding. Um, and there were some fairly like significant people talking about it as well. It wasn't just you know people on Reddit or Twitter. And then I, I, I think... It was eight hours after Trump's election when CalExit, uh, you know, California leaving was, was was starting to get discussed. So to what extent is secession a, a legitimate political possibility? And to what extent is it a way of people showing their displeasure like like all the celebrities who are constantly cl- saying that they're going to, you know, move to Canada if, if the person they don't like gets elected? Or, you know, even what uh, Prince Harry and Meghan, who were in Canada and said they wouldn't live in in the United States until Trump was no longer president. And I think they're already in LA pandemic or no pandemic. So to what extent is talk of secession, just a way of forcefully uh, displaying your displeasure with an electoral result? Well, I don't know what the answer to that is. You're asking to what extent are they, might they simply be uh, posturing like little children? And Mm -hmm. I admit that, uh, you know, that probably describes a fair bit of the anger on the left, a, a lot of moral posturing. Uh, you know, on the other hand, I think uh, were they to seriously bring up the possibility, and the more they'd look into it, I think the more it might seem attractive to them. Right. right. Okay. I mean, uh, if you recall in the debate about secession in Quebec, uh, Premier Barassa invented something called profitable federalism. Mm-hmm. And the idea is in net transfers, uh, Quebec got more from Ottawa than it gave to Ottawa. Yes. yes. But with respect to California, for example, it's just the opposite. California gives a lot more to the feds than it gets back. And were it a separate country and didn't have to contribute towards the American military, it would save enough money to fund its own form of national health. So then you imagine a politician utterly fed up with uh, a a second Trump administration saying, you know, we can go our own way. Our choices remaining in the country led by this person we despise or having a form of national health in California. I think a lot of people might think national health in California trumps nationalism. Now, one of the the interesting questions I, I really did want to ask you is 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 there was a, a former BBC correspondent who wrote a fascinating essay over at Unheard, where he explained uh, the the backlash that that he theorizes could be coming after Trump, and he thinks along the same lines as you in terms of what the left wants to do, why they are so angry. But he had a slightly different take on what they were going to do, and so I wanted to get your take on that. He he speculated that if they regain control, let's say if they win. Uh, they win back the White House this year or next or, or, or next time around, that basically the, they, what they're going to do is ensure they can never lose again. So expand uh, the Supreme Court to ensure uh, that they, they have enough justices to get their preferred policies, um, do away with the Electoral College to ensure that the, the blue states never have to live uh, with, with, with the, the choices of the red states ever again, and, and, and he pinpoints a, a bunch of these policies laid out by different Democratic nominees. A lot of the Democratic nominees floated and flirted with a lot of policies that everybody knew um, what weren't going to be put into motion this time around, but were very obviously trial balloons, right? Um, Beto O'Rourke was sort of the useful idiot of the Democratic field and that he, he floated the sorts of things they say in private, in public, and, and then people could gauge how they did. So I, I'm wondering, what do you think is a more likely route for the left to take uh, in the event uh, that they regain the Oval Office, either this time or next time, do away with the rules that ensured they've lost or to split off entirely? Because it seems like some of the indications are they can't, they, they, well, it's not that they can't win the game by these rules, but at least they've lost quite a lot by these rules. So let's just change the rules of the game. Well, I think you're, uh, first of all, I'm not familiar with the uh, the article you refer to in, hot, in, in whatever it was. <laughs> Um, but I think you fairly describe the left's 
ideas about the Constitution. Uh, there are really two constitutions. There is a conservative constitution, which goes back to the framers. And then you have a liberal constitution, which means by any means necessary. Right. right. So if the constitution gets in the way, uh, we're not going to be able to amend it, but somehow let's try to do a workaround. Um, you know, that I, I don't think they could easily get away with uh, getting rid of the, the electoral college. By the way, as a, an example of the difference between politics in Canada and politics in the United States, it is, I cannot tell you how much, the greatest of national tragedies when uh, a president is chosen who was not the winner in the popular vote. That happened in 2000 and 2016. That happens in Canada, it's no big deal. It happens in Britain, it's no big deal. I mean, Right, it happened here last time around. Yeah, last time around, the Tories got more votes than the Liberals. Yep. Um, there was a lot of sort of complaining, but I think everybody's a lot more used to that sort of thing happening. It's not uncommon even. Right, well, exactly. Uh, you know, what, what is really uncommon would be any party getting a majority. But, but, you know, the point is, the point I'm trying to make is Canadians are more willing to play by the rules of the game. Right, right. So, you know, it's sometimes said in America, oh, Canada, you don't even have a constitution, which, <laughs> which is to say they know nothing about Canada. Uh, the, the people who don't really have a constitution are the people on the left who see it as an encumbrance, which they'd like to get rid of one way or the other. And, and, and indeed, by, by packing the court, right? Um, you, know, the, the, you know, it's sometimes said the left votes, the right votes in a block, but it doesn't. It never does in the Supreme Court, but the left does pretty much. Yeah. yeah. Uh, on, on important issues involving presidential power, for example. So, yeah, stacking the court would be a way of basically ripping up the Constitution, which is what they'd want. So your, the point of your, your question, I think, was in those kinds of cases, might it be the conservative states that want out? Right. Right. right? And I don't know what the answer is at that point. I mean... That's entirely too hypothetical. How feasible a, a political project do you think secession is? Um, I think that once the, once the game gets started, it's hard to bring an end to it. And again, 1861 is a good example. 1860, nobody thinks there's going to be a breakup of, of the country. Uh, everybody thinks the South will come to its senses. Uh, there is strong unionist sentiment here in my state of Virginia. Um, you know, nobody thinks we're going to go to war for heaven's sakes. Uh, there are a number of newspapers which, uh, which, which, which argue that, uh, for heaven's sakes, let's not go to war. And they're promptly shut down by Lincoln's cabinet. So, you know, it's, it's, uh, it's not something that was bound to happen. Even in February of 1861, there was a, con a convention of estates called, the, and a bunch of elder statesmen attended, and they wanted to find a compromise. And what the Southern delegates were told is, no country in the world better protects slavery than our country does, which right. is true. You know, not only do you have a right of slavery in your states, but if you want to, we Northern Republicans will put it in the Constitution that slavery will be perpetually guaranteed in America. You want it, you got it. And somehow it wasn't enough for the Southern delegates, right? What they said is it's not enough that we have a guaranteed right of slavery, but you must respect our right of slavery, even as we respect your right of property and other kinds of ownership. And that the Northerners never could do. And the Southerner who voiced that was a month later the Secretary of War in Richmond. So at some point it becomes not economic, it becomes more than political, it becomes a psychological issue. And in terms of the psychology of it all, we're pretty divided right now. I mean, Look, you know, there isn't much by way of the mystic chords of memory to which Lincoln alluded in, in his inaugural address in 1861. Instead, you have 
uh, uh, an educational system dominated by the left, which preaches contempt for America. You have the, the 1619 project of the New York Times, which now is making its way into teaching plans in our K-12 schools. And the point of, uh, the point of that being that all of American history is to be interpreted in terms of how we mistreated uh, black Americans. So, you know, rather than trying to inculcate pride in America, we're trying to inculcate hatred in America. And, and, you know, I get it because I moved here from Canada. And, hey, after all, Canadians invented anti-Americanism. Mm-hmm. Canadians define themselves as not American. Yeah, not Americans. And we did it. Uh, I'm sorry, we. Uh, I'm a dual, but. I'm a dual citizen. I'm a dual citizen as well. So we got to watch ourselves, huh? Mm-hmm. We do. Okay. We do. <laughs> well, speaking speaking as a Canadian, I mean, Canada was the first authentically counter-revolutionary state, right? Uh, with people like Sir, Sir John Grave Simcoe in Upper Canada, uh, and it always, as you say, defined itself in opposition to uh, to what was happening in in in. Uh, uh, in the United States, if, if I can just recount one anecdote, the dean mm-hmm. of my law school when I was a student, afterwards a colleague of mine, was a great, 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 great grandson of Sir John Beverly Robinson, uh, the Attorney General of Upper Canada, who carried a musket in the War of 1812 and whose father fought in the Revolutionary War on the Loyalist side and whose grandfather was the Speaker of the Virginia House of Burgesses, who heard what he thought was a... Uh, 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 an inflammatory speech by Patrick Henry. Patrick Henry said that uh, Julius Caesar had his Brutus and Charles I had his Cromwell and George III, at which point the speaker said, treason, treason, and Patrick Henry said, if this be treason, then make the most of it. So, you know, (laughs) we have bloodlines that go all the way back to the loyalists. I have students, I had students at McGill with names like Peter Oliver, that was a famous loyalist name, uh, John, uh, uh, Jonathan Sewell was the attorney general, loyalist attorney general of Massachusetts before the war. Uh, John Sewell was a mayor of Toronto at some point. I mean, you know, the mm-hmm. uh, United Empire influence remains. Well, how, in your, in your estimation, did America get to this, this polarized point where secession even is a, a discussion? So regardless of whether or not it's bluster, the bluster is coming from both sides. In 2012, we were hearing about Texas wanting to leave. 2016, we're hearing about California wanting to leave, right? You've, you know, there's enough material there for you to write a, 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 an entire book laying it out, and I've read a lot of the op-eds as well, and, and, and you make a very persuasive case. So what's the backstory to how America got so polarized that secession is starting to look good to some states? I think it's really simple. Back in 1992, Irving Kristol, the great neoconservative, <laughs> said the culture wars are over, the left won. Well, and so the left thought it de- indeed did have ownership over the American idea. It thought it owned the courts. It thought it owned the media. It was right there. It thought it owned... Uh, not just higher ed, but K-12 as well. They were all, they, 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 they were completely correct about that. Okay. And they thought that everything would fall into their lap in time. There'd be some uh, rear guard resistance from benighted people in Alabama and the like. But, you know, but nevertheless, we'd bring them in tow. Um, and then Trump is elected. And I think, that, you see, the, the, the point about the Trump victory was it, meant that things were contested, which people thought were not contested anymore, i.e. Right. the left's dominance over our politics and culture. And all of a sudden, you know, it wasn't so clear. I should have liked to have seen Trump take the fight more closely to the left on a lot of these issues. But after all, he's only three years into it and uh, cut the fellow some slack, I suppose. A re-election would mean, I think, a, a greater emphasis on taking back our culture. I mean, I, I, I think it's important to, I think it would be useful to try to defund the left more than we have. Yeah. Yeah. And I think it would be useful to break up the monasteries. That is to say, though I'm on the wrong side in terms of religion on this one, I should like to see something like a Thomas Cromwell breaking up the institutions of 
higher learning, uh, mm -hmm. a, at least the way they're coddled at this particular point. I mean, it's there's an, a scandal in the way in which we teach crap to our university students and then saddle them with unconscionable levels of debt. All of that has made universities fat and rich. We need to defund that and we need to return to more like the system of education one had in Canada. I mean, I mean, as you know, uh, tuition is lower in Canada, and that's the deal that the government made with universities when it decided to fund student loans. They didn't do that here with the result that tuition went up like crazy. And it you know, flowed into the pocket of university administrators and professors, most of whom, nearly all of whom, are rapidly left-wing. Yeah. So one of the issues that I'm primarily preoccupied with is abortion. And so I wanted uh, to kind of talk for a minute about the role that this issue plays in catalyzing the culture wars and driving the desire for something like secession. Because it's sort of interesting. On one hand, you see, you see the left basically treating Roe v. Wade as this sort of sacred cow. When in reality, I think that if Roe v. Wade got overturned, it might be a best case scenario for the left because they would suddenly have millions of voters up for grabs who were no longer voting on that one issue. For example, if Joe Biden wasn't such a radical on the abortion issue, having even gotten on, uh, sort of gotten rid of his pre prior support for the Hyde Amendment and, 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 and offloaded any of the Catholic conscience that he had left on this issue. But if, if, he, if, if the abortion issue wasn't a, a key issue on the federal level, he would probably get a lot of, a lot of unhappy Trump voters but there are many, many people that I know, I'm sure many people that you know, who will never, ever vote for a Democrat as long as abortion and Roe v. Wade are primary issues. So in reality, Roe v. Wade kind of hamstrung the left because there are millions of people that they could pr potentially persuade on economics or any number of other issues who are voting only on this issue of whether or not it is, it, it is permissible to kill a preborn child in the womb, yes or no. And so... I've I've always thought that that Roe v. Wade getting overturned actually might be the best case political scenario for the left. It would re return it to the states, and it would take a lot of air out of the presidential debates. And I wanted to know, in the context of your thesis, to what extent do you think the issue of abortion has essentially shaped national politics and contributed enormously to this polarization? Well, the, to understand American politics, I think it's important to understand that the median voter is a Catholic. In this country right right and that was particularly true with the manner in which the 2016 campaign was run i, I speak from personal experience uh and in terms of the way in which well the way in which we got trump to turn around on catholics but also the way in which the vote turned out in in crucial states like uh ohio and and and, and michigan and, and even wisconsin um that was a sleeper issue for both parties. Um, I credit friends of mine who really made the effort work in 2016. Um, you're right. It's an issue that resonates with Catholics as median voters. As far as liberals are concerned, it's not an issue, except to the extent it might be threatened by Neanderthals Trump might appoint to the court. So again, right. you know, playing with the idea of a looming threat of a national breakup, imagine that some of the pro-abortion people on the Supreme Court go the way of all flesh, and Trump gets to appoint uh, some other solid conservatives to the, to, to, the, to the court, and you actually have a majority to reverse Roe v. Wade. You suggest that the left might be happy with that form of federalism. I disagree. I think that nothing would move us more closely to secession than that. I wouldn't say they would be happy with it, but just that ironically they might have better electoral success on the presidential level if Roe v. Wade wasn't driving everything. Well, no, they're hiding behind Roe v. Wade. They cannot go to the country on restrictions on abortion of the kind they'd favor because they'd lose. In right, short, right. they'd have to moderate themselves on, on issues of abortion. But remember, the Democratic Party is a party of elites. It's not a party of common people. It's a party of people who have a, an absolutely religious faith on the need for abortion. They'll never, ever give that up. I can't imagine them giving that up. Right. It's, it's one of their core issues, like euthanasia, for heaven's sakes. 
uh, and, you know, and of course, this is true in Canada as well as the United States. They're leaving vast swaths of, of voters behind in all of that. Um, and they're doing it because they can get away with it under the Constitution and under su the Supreme Court rulings of the American and Canadian Supreme Court. So, um, you know, I, I, I don't have an easy political fix on abortion, except I do think it should be a political issue and not a constitutional issue. Right. Generally, I, I think, you know, the, some, a lot of pressure for a split up will come from a highly centralized country that through its Congress and through its Supreme Court tries to make a uniform set of rules for 330 million people. We're too damn big for that. Mm -hmm. and we're too different. So, yes, let Alabama go its own way. Uh, so besides abortion, what are some of the other key catalyzing issues playing into your theory about the looming threat of a national breakup? It's more like the left's control over the, 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 the great institutions of our culture, in the media, in education. Um, I would foresee a very a likelihood of secession if those are taken away from the left. Will that happen? Well, wait and see if Trump is reelected and wait and see if Trump can take control of the Republican Party. He hasn't yet. You don't think so? The operating theory is that he has taken over the GOP. How would you say he hasn't? Well, the operating theory is one that's communicated by leftist idiots, so they're wrong, okay? Uh, he hasn't taken control. What he doesn't have is a, uh, a group of people willing to oppose him uh, openly. There are plenty of people in the party who don't like him. The Republican Congressional Campaign Committee is dominated by Mitt Romney supporters, for example. It's also the case that important parts of a Trump agenda are anathema to a lot of traditional Republican conservatives. I mean, to understand the Trump agenda, you have to recognize how it is left of center on important economic issues. And Trump has not brought the party over on that. Recall what happened in two years of united Republican government from 2017 to 2019. And what did we get out of that? We got one piece of legislation we got a tax code, and the tax code was, the, the reform was coopered together in Congress by principally Paul Ryan and McConnell, and it was a very right-wing form of reform. In other words, it left untouched much of the scandal of the American tax code, right, the way in which it'll uh, transfer money from the poor to the rich. Uh, you know, to understand you know, Trump's victory, I wrote something about this in the Wall Street Journal in 2017. I also wrote about my a book a couple of years back. Um, the Trump party is a party that's nationalistic and, uh, and, and one that believes in the greatness of the American experiment. But it also is left of center on issues like welfare. I mean, uh, and, and the right never got that. I mean, really early on, I had dinner with somebody who's an executive at the Charles Koch Foundation, and, and he, I, he asked me who I'd support. This is like February 2016. I said, Trump. He said, I, you know, I sort of get it, but what about entitlements? And I thought, you total idiot. You don't get it. I mean, we're not about removing entitlements. We're about protecting the safety net. That's what American right. voters want. So a Trump Republican Party would be a party different from that of most Republicans right now. We haven't captured the party yet. They haven't even figured it out. Right. So in your mind, if, if this happened, if the looming national breakup uh, moves from a theory into a reality, how would that unfold? Well, the first, I mean, recall Sovereignty Association. I mean, René Levesque recognized um, he didn't want a unilateral act of secession. 
I mean, it wasn't clear whether that would be permitted. Now the Canadian Supreme Court has spoken up, and we know more about how secession would unfold in Canada, where there, for example, something like a Wexit. Um, and what it would involve basically would be a lot of negotiations about things like splitting up the national debt and so on. Uh, and as you'll recall, in its clarity reference, what the Supreme Court said is, well, on the one hand, there's no absolute right of secession. On the other hand, we believe in democracy. It's one of the fundamental norms of, of our country. And if you have a clear vote for secession from a province, you can't ignore it. And I think I think the same thing would happen in, 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 in the United States. I think, in other words, the American Supreme Court would firstly be seized of the issue, and secondly, would probably can't end up more or less where the Canadians did, where I guess Frank Iacobucci did in, in the uh, clarity reference in the Canadian Supreme Court. Um, and that would mean something like a convention of estates has happened in February 1861, where the parties would get together and decide, well, what happens now? Uh, are we going to have free movement of goods? Are we going to have free movement of people? You know, those kinds of issues. It's the association end of sovereignty association that would be up for discussion. Do you think that such a movement would come primarily from the left or primarily from the right? Well, it, there might be a point where the initiative began with the left and where people on the right might say something like, don't let the door hit you on the way out. Right. Do you think this would be a bad thing? Um, I don't think it would be a bad thing. I think it would help cure a lot of problems of bigness in America. Uh, smaller countries are happier countries. Smaller countries are less corrupt. Uh, smaller countries are more attuned to the voters in, in their districts. So the kind of sorting out might have a, might, might be a way of curing the culture wars, right? Instead of having a culture war involving the entire country, we'd have people moving to states where their policies are more attuned to their preferences. Uh, right. you know, that sorting out would be benign. And there's a lot to be said for smaller countries. Uh, look, Canada is a small country. Okay, in terms of population, but it's, you know, it's, it's doing rather well, obviously. You take a look at, at the countries that are on top in terms of measures of freedom and the like, and, uh, you know, happiness, and what are we looking at? We're looking at Nordic countries, for example, you know, we're, we're, we're looking at Canada, Australia. So, you know, so what would we give up? Well, maybe that goes to what American pride is all about. I've, I've lived here for 30 years. I, I don't think I can say I really understand it, except that it seemed to me that an important part of the pride that many Americans feel in their country is the idea that it owns all the guns in the room and can turn any other country into the, back to the Stone Age if it wants. And I, you know, and to the extent that's part of it, that desire for glory, I don't share it. Of course, you know, if you're Canadian, you don't share it at all, right? Is there such a thing as, you know, glory? I mean, it's, it's, it's in the national anthem, fine. But apart from that, you know, you don't have too many people saying, yes, Canada, we can destroy the Bahamas if we want. I mean, that's it's not the Canadian psyche, but, but I think it's part of the American one. The idea that uh, we don't like to admit it, but the world's policemen, and we kind of like the fact that we've got the big baton and we're walking the streets. Um, now this goes back to the kind of debates people had back in the 60s about, you know, America's role in Vietnam and the like. The Canadians don't share that. But then on the other hand, Canada never fought an ignoble war nor ever lost one either. Neither of those things can be said of the United States. Final question would be, where can our listeners and our viewers find your work if they want to read more? Well, I publish, uh, I have a column in the New York Post, and I, uh, I'm, I can always be found on Amazon. All right. Well, thank you so much for taking the time to join us. We really appreciate it. No problem. Thank you very much. Ladies and gentlemen, that was my conversation with author, columnist, and scholar F.H. Buckley on his new book, American Secession, The Looming Threat of a National Breakup. 
Thanks so much for joining us this week. If you want to check out other important news, commentary, interviews, head over to LifeSiteNews.com, click on the podcast tab, and you'll find our past shows. We have a show like this every single week, and we'd be thrilled if you join us. Thanks so much again. Hope to see you next week.